If you visit non-sketchy sites, now if you're going to sketchy corners of the internet, I make no promises. <laughs> There's a lot of weird things that can happen that I'm not going to speak for. Listeners, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 6 of Bad Voltage, the very Yay. first show after Bad Voltage Live in Pasadena. And uh, Ak yeah. is clearly very happy about that. My name's Jeremy. I'm here with John Owen Ak, as always, but I'm also here with a special guest, Jeff Atwood. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. How are you today? Hey, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you on board. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Jeff is, three of you, um, <laughs> Jeff is the... Uh, is is one of the original founders of Stack Exchange, and of course one of the uh, founders of the Discourse Forum, as well as well as probably multiple other things. What tell us something you've done, Jeff, that we probably don't know about that's interesting? Oh gosh, well that's uh, a difficult one. Well, can I start with uh, the company's actually called? They changed the name back to Stack Overflow, <laughs> so you oh, can just really? say yeah, they did. So you can just say <laughs> Stack Overflow. Um, oh, cool. Although half of the network is as big as Stack Overflow, but it's it's easier right. to recognize by Stack there Overflow. There we go. Done it. Uh, one thing like you it. might not know about me is I was arrested, well, not quite arrested, but got in trouble with the law for freaking as a, as a teenager, because back in the day, uh, if you wanted to do any of this fancy online communication stuff, you had to pay long distance fees, which were quite substantial. So you had to figure wow. out a way of getting around all that and essentially stealing phone service from the telco. So I did get into some trouble right before I you went to college busted? for that. Did you have a blue box? Uh, no, I just did war dialing, which was like dialing. I oh, wrote a program that would <laughs> yeah. dial uh, and then enter a bunch of codes. Because sometimes you had services that have four-digit codes, which are pretty easy to figure out, right? <laughs> um, right. The, the, the Meridian people who did the PBXs, I imagine. Did, did you have a good <laughs> nickname that was related to serial or no? Uh... <laughs> I had, I think I went by Cap, when I started. I went by like Captain Kirk, and uh-huh. then I and then I switched to like Cyborg. I think later that was my other little you know. You're you're you I, I was in high school, so forgive me <laughs> for these choices no. that I was making. Uh, so, I, I, I won't worry about it too much. Our own Jonathan Bacon was at one point. Axe Maniac, if I remember rightly. Oh, it nice. Was. I was Axe Maniac, and then VM Linners at one point as well. <laughs> and, f- and, and for those of you who uh, who are quite young, freaking was uh, was the act of yes, basically stealing phone service back in the day. It wasn't as is the definition today, having disappointing sex at the back of a Beyonce concert. So uh, <laughs> Jeff Atwood has never been accused of anything along those lines. All right, so. What we're going to talk about in the show, uh, because we've got Jeff on, and Jeff has got this like long history of, of working on really interesting like communication uh, technology, like such as Stack Exchange and Stack Overflow and Discourse. We're going to talk about what the future of open source communication is going to look like. You know, back in the old days, we had mailing lists and and IRC and things like that, and now we're seeing more Slack and Discourse and video conferencing. So we're going to d- dig into what the future of open source communication is going to be. We're also going to look at Google Home, which has recently decided to tell everyone that Beauty and the Beast is out, whether they wanted to or not, and talk about (laughs) whether that's a good idea, and more generally, whether ads supporting this kind of service is the way to go. And now, Cinderella and Bad Voltage. All right, should we do some news? Time for the news. We should. All right, so we should start out with our special guest, uh, Jeff. Uh, what news have you got for us today? Well, I saw on today on Hacker News something that I actually didn't know anything about, which is the 2038 problem, which is there's a 32-bit What's that? time there's a 32-bit time t value in Unix that will exceed its 32-bit value in the year 2038. So it's basically the Y2K problem but the unix version yes. of it. And I hadn't heard about <laughs> yeah. this. They're actually working on it now because there's so many embedded systems, right? I mean, there's still going to be right. systems <laughs> running this stuff. And it's actually kind of worse than Y2K from what I'm reading. Yeah. Because really? it, it, it affects it, the kernel. Like, the kernel will fail. Right. Ba- basically, they just 20 year this, lead time is enough to get everything fixed. Well, that's the hope. Speaking as a guy who was working for an insurance company in 1999 who did a bunch of COBOL stuff on mainframes, and it was all 
changing pick 99 into pick 9999 in COBOL code all over the place. <laughs> this time, not quite as rushed, hopefully. <laughs> It was it was a, 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 a disappointing letdown, uh, Y2K. I was expecting there to be at least something a little bit more movie-worthy. So, uh, you know, I, not that I'm necessarily wishing doom and destruction, but <laughs> given the fact that we'll probably have 100 billion IoT devices by that point, I'm hoping that this is going to be somehow fixed and resolved yeah, but the terrible Chinese army of IoT devices that we've talked about. To be honest with you, they're, they're already a problem, right? The, the timing stopping working is not going to make them any worse. Um, sticky sticky devices out there on the internet with username admin, password admin is the problem here. Not that time T is going to roll over. <laughs> but I mean... Yeah, that seems given fair. The, given the fact that everyone's actually working on this now, does it feel like it's going to be... A, to me, it feels like it's just going to be fixed. Admittedly, I'm hand-waving. Well, hopefully. I just I, was interested that I had never really heard about this until today. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it also affects fi- certain file systems because they have 32-bit timestamps. Uh, they're not yeah, necessarily you... popular file systems, which is good, the good news, even, even today. Yeah, it's like EXT3, right? Which I think we're on EXT4, right? Or beyond? I think yeah, so. EXT4, is it? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Huh. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Co- Very cool. Color me skeptical. <laughs> Yeah, we'll see. All right, language. What have you got for us? Right, um, my news. Um, amusing thing, actually. Um, Alphabet, Google's parent company or uh, stock ownership company, or whatever. Um, they've had their stock downgraded from buy to hold by at least um one set of advisors because loads of firms have started boycotting YouTube because they're sick of seeing their adverts that they've paid for showing up on a bunch of appalling hate speech videos. <laughs> um, really. And- uh, uh, amazing that people are offended by this and don't want it to happen. But more importantly, YouTube have started saying, well, we need to think about the content of some of the videos. Maybe we should ban some stuff. And then banning things like LGBT videos and not banning the hate speech stuff. So lots of people very pissed off about this, and justifiably so. Yeah. This is a bit of a slippery slope, though, isn't it? Because, I mean define hate hate videos right i mean there are i mean there are there are there are some definitions of hate speech right but uh you know how, where do you draw the line on, uh, on youtube i mean le- obviously leave, you know leave aside for the moment um that particular discussion although i don't particularly want youtube to become reddit thank you very much but i do think it's perfectly reasonable that someone paying money to advertise or to have some influence over what their ads get shown against yeah. well, i think the problem too is the way that advertising has changed, advertisers don't want to spend the time to go to individual high quality sites, right? They want to go to something like Google, who now controls 40% of all digital advertising as of last year, and shotgun Jeez. it everywhere. But part of shotgunning it everywhere is that it is, in fact, then shotgun everywhere. Lo and behold. <laughs> so I, I don't know. This seems like the only logical outcome for the way they were buying inventory. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. I don't really know anything about what happens when stock gets downgraded. So, you know, ah, um, this, is, okay. this, is, this, is, this is just some people going, but we were advising you to buy alphabet stock. And now we're advising you not to buy it at the moment. Right. It's made up sound like a bit more than it actually is. Is it really, I mean, is something like this caught? I mean, I'm, I guess I'm surprised. Not that I'm saying that, you know, this ads on hate speech thing is, I'm not saying it's a good thing. Right. But I'm surprised that in the in the financial services world, which is often detached uh, from from ethics, I guess you could say in certain ways, that anyone would even care about that. Uh, it no, so it wasn't about, it it wasn't about ethics. Well. It was one of their largest ad spends pulled four hundred yeah. million dollars worth of spend very publicly, oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. a bunch that's, of other companies different. said uh, we might do the same thing. D- d- so it d- had nothing fi- to do at all with morals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The financial people are not going, we think this is a terrible thing that you're doing, Google, um, and that we're going to punish your stock for it. What's no. happening is, uh, is 200 major league brands have said we're not spending any money with Google anymore because of this issue, and then the, the market people have gone, whoa, no more money for you, Google, downgrade the stock. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. Can I point out right. one one difference here? So the company Shopify yeah. got in yeah. controversy because they were <clears throat> selling Breitbart like 
merchandise. But I think there's a difference here that you guys point out, which is uh, important, that it's about what advertising displays alongside the content. Yeah. And obviously, you have a bunch of different advertising you can choose from, right? That's Google's whole job, is to decide the correct advertising to show to a given user on a given page, right? So this is, like, firmly in their area of expertise. <laughs> like, even right. if they just flag the videos as, like, <laughs> controversial or, I don't know, political something, Right. Like, you right, can just right, display right. other advertising there. So, it's, the difference here is that Shopify was very adamant that they can't not sell merchandise for someone. That would be like not serving the web page, kind of, yeah. right? Uh, or versus, okay. like, serving the web page with, you know, these little, you know, barnacles of advertisement next to them. So, uh, that seems <laughs> yeah. very doable. Like, this seems like something right. Google should be able to do, like, in their sleep, basically. Totally. Uh, and one I of mean, the changes I, I, they made is they used to opt you into a bunch of categories that they now opt you out of by default, which seems like a pretty sensible thing to do. Yeah. And have I, you guys I, been to, like, your Google, like, console that shows, like, all the things that you, like, all the stuff Google knows about you? Yeah. Anybody listening who hasn't done this, you should do this. I don't know the exact URL, but it's funny. It'll it'll list, like, everything Google <laughs> thinks it knows about you, like, your age, your interests, like, all this crazy stuff. And you can actually delete really? a bunch of it, too, if you don't like it. Yeah. Yeah, have you ever seen that? Um, after they after they um, joined up with double click and everything, they start, um, uh, that fed a bunch of information into this. So you look at it and he says, "We think you like the following things, and we think you're this age, and we think this is where you live, and so on and so forth." And it's a combination of terrifying and wildly inaccurate. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I can't decide wow. um, okay. which, which I think. But you spend a bunch of time looking at it and going, "Okay, I can trace the fact that you think I like this back to this one search I did two years ago." <laughs> Right. Well, well, actually, we'll put a link to that in the show notes because if you have never been there, you should definitely go there. You really well, should. Well, I just I'm want to point out that. I just went there and it says my topics are food and drink, parenting, shopping, TV and video, and I'm also 65 plus and male. So a little bit off there, <laughs> Google. <laughs> Not quite 65 yet. But Jeff Atwood, heavy user of oil of OLED. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> These kids need to get off Jeremy, my lawn. That's, that's the main problem. That's why I came on the show to tell all the kids to get off my lawn. <laughs> get off the lawn. Uh, so the one that I yeah. had was an article that was recently in Bloomberg entitled Apple's Next Big Thing, Augmented Reality. And it was about CEO uh, t- uh, Tim Cook, obviously, now is betting pretty heavily on augmented reality. And um, I brought this up for two reasons. A, I'm intrigued by the ability of the press to kind of take a tech idea that Apple isn't in and spin that into Apple kind of being the dark horse that will legitimize and then win the category by default, even though we know that's not to be true with streaming video and their streaming TV and some other things they've entered and then not done. But right. that part intrigued me. But I'm curious what impact you guys think this is going to have on AR because having talked about this previously on the show, I know it's a topic that we have differing opinions on. I love the idea of AR. I think it's going to be interesting. Although it, the the thing that I'm curious to see is um, just how it becomes a real how it becomes a real thing and not just a toy. Like it's it's the, there's clear applications within the area of gaming and uh, and you know the entertainment side of things. But I'm curious to see how AR like plays an active role in people's lives. You know, we've right. seen kind of an element of that, like some elements kind of with Google Glass where it's more like overlaid kind of content, but you could you could see that within the context of something like that. But I I just don't know. But then again, I'm historically terrible at predicting these things. Like I, I thought the iPad when it first came out was completely ludicrous, and uh, and I was obviously wrong about that. Tablets have, have had a pretty positive impact. So yeah. Uh, I'm, what do you guys think? What, it would be good, it would be good to see some different thinking in here. If you talk talk to people about AR, it's all about either gaming or it's some kind of appalling Blade Runner future where I'm walking down the street and there's all these little pop up call outs above every shop with adverts that aren't actually there in reality. Right? I don't right. want my reality to be right. augmented. If that's what you're going to augment it with, it's a crap idea. Pack it in. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> It would be nice to have um, what one of the things that Apple are good at is coming up with a new way of looking at a problem, which everyone then goes, "Oh man, we should absolutely do that," and then copies it. I'm right. not sure that the things that they build would have a major effect because anything they build is by definition only going to work for Apple users. But I can see them changing the influencing the direction of the industry, and that'd be nice. So I think a lot of listeners yep. know our opinions on AR and VR. Jeff, do you, do you have any opinion on either? You know, I don't, but 
it's interesting how many people think. I think VR and AR are just really still very far off. Like I think the physics is really daunting for what they're trying yeah. to do. It's not so much is the software good enough. I think it's not even remotely the correct question. It's about the physics of delivering this stuff wirely, wirelessly, essentially on your eye, yeah. like directly into your eye is really the best way to do it. Because right now they're just literally strapping well for for vr at least they're strapping smartphones to your face that's literally what oculus is it's yeah. a smartphone <laughs> strapped to your face and if you have a google um uh, google cardboard is actually really cool i actually want to we'll plug google cardboard because there's cardboard compatible mounts that are just basically inexpensive like 20 dollars mounts that you can like slap a phone into and you can get a really decent vr experience from this for like no money and there's all these really good yeah. youtube content and google maps and you don't have to spend like you know, eight hundred plus dollars plus have it like a really beefy, like literally a Windows gaming PC to do, right. you know, three D yeah. VR. It's like you can do a pretty good approximation with Google Cardboard and that Daydream View the thing they have is basically a very fancy Google cardboard uh that Google yeah. sells. Yeah. So I would say you'd know, experiment with that and see what you think. I just feel like we're so far off from this stuff yeah. being really viable on so no, many I levels. Agree. Like, you know, wireless, like super high resolution. It's crazy. It's, the- it's interesting as well. Our neighbor here is, he's really into VR. Like he's, I think he's thinking about setting up a startup at some, at some point in VR. And one of the things that he was saying is, you know, for example, with telepresence, which he's particularly interested in, is it's not about photorealistic characters and things like that. It's about eye contact. So like the, the upcoming VR headsets are actually going to be doing eye tracking. Um, so you can then actually make eye contact, which you can't do in a, like on a webinar today or a video chat or something along those lines. <laughs> so what's interesting to me is like those human elements are really what makes a lot of this kind of stuff work. And that Clearly, it's not quite there yet. It's, so. it's nowhere near there. You're, you're, you're no. talking about, if you, if you try and do something on that today, that's like building a house in the Uncanny Valley and then moving into it. Right? It's terrible. <laughs> I think the thing that I find fascinating yeah. about VR in general is it's been right around the corner for 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. Like AI. It's yeah. one of those things where I agree. There's all the danger signs of... A technology is so hard that, like, we always think we're on the yeah. cusp, and it's still yeah. just really, really far away. It is yeah. the I, literal definition of jam tomorrow. <laughs> there was a thing in the fifties, I think, or the sixties, um, when they first started doing research into computer vision processing. Um, apparently, one of the professors said, "Oh well, um, we should get some people to work on this idea of, you know, um, textual recognition and face recognition. So let's put a couple of students on that for a couple of months, and then they'll have that sorted." And that was fifty years ago, and we still yeah. can't. Well, <laughs> it's funny you should say that that neatly leads on to my new story which is that a new technology is combining lip motion and passwords for user authentication okay so quote uh, scientists from the hong kong baptist university have developed a new user authentication system that relies on reading lip motions while the user speaks a password out loud uh, the idea is that uh, it combines the best parts of classic password-based uh, systems with the good parts of biometrics. It relies on the uniqueness of someone's lips, such as their shape, texture, and lip motions, and allows someone to change the lip motion um, in case the system ever gets compromised. So you, too, listeners, can sit there and say, my password is E, lowercase <laughs> f, <laughs> one, exclamation point. <laughs> like, I can't wait to see a whole bus or subway full of people <clears throat> saying horse battery staple all at once. That's, that's, what, that's what it's going to be. My password is combining character upper delta dash. Um, but this is great. I mean, they're not the only people doing it. There's, um, there's, uh, uh, there's a company in Belfast called Leopa, who were spin out of Queen's College Belfast, been doing the same thing for uh, a couple of years. But this to me sounds brilliant. The idea that I could say, okay, now do this, my password is fishes or swordfish, is the canonical one. And it would recognize that and other people could hear me say it but not copy it. That's brilliant. That's like witchcraft. That's not being able to say yeah. spells, right? Just do it. Make this thing. A wait, thing wait. I don't think it, does it make anything more secure when the when the person in the mafia still hits you with that five dollar wrench from the XKCD comic? <laughs> you're just going to still mouth your own password into your. Mouth. <laughs> well, this is true. <laughs> also, are people's lips that unique. And what happens if you've got like those fake duck lips that the Kardashians have? I mean, how is that going to work? <laughs> There are too many. Uh, I guess one Botox <laughs> so. and every password you've ever had is invalidated. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you guys tried uh, Windows Hello, the facial recognition login thing? Because I have. 
Oh, I haven't tried it on Windows. I've tried, I've tried the Android one. I've tried the Android yeah. one as well. How's it? How's it work? Yeah, what did you think Is of it, it when you tried it? Um, I tried it. It was semi-reliable, and then I thought, okay, so now someone could just hold up a Polaroid of me and log into my phone. <laughs> so I turned it off again. I haven't used it for real. I'm scared of it. Well, it's supposed um, to do depth. I'm sure they thought of that. Let's use depth information as well. It's not just supposed to be. Yeah, paper. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's how Windows Hello works. But the problem with Windows Hello is when I have my glasses off, it doesn't know who I am. It's like, who the hell are you? Who the hell oh, really? are you? Trying to... Yeah, it totally doesn't. Really? I mean, I assume you'd have to like teach Superman? it. Like Superman? You'd have to teach your face with and without glasses. Like you do multiple fingers with, you know, iOS. But that means if you wear with... a hat sometimes and not others, or Eck wears different hats, so we would have to train it for every single hat he owns. I think <laughs> that's the, the, the wow, idea. This of... is incredible. So. Staggering into my office before I've had a shower in the morning and gazing blearily at the screen and looking at me and going, yeah, I don't think that's that guy with a suit on who trained this. <laughs> that's just... <laughs> my own daughter you can, doesn't you can recognize You can only train it with that picture from Bad Voltage Live. <laughs> also, once again, Hollywood is always right. Because, you know, from, from watching movies, it turns out that, um, you know, you, you get Clark Kent and... The glasses go on, completely different, you know, person to Superman. And in the same way, you get the the clearly hired model who puts glasses on and is the dorky girl who has no <laughs> friends in the teen drama. I'm glad that Microsoft have been employing this. All right, let's move on. We're done with the news. So I think it would be remiss if we didn't talk about something while we got Jeff on the show. Like, Jeff has, has got a long history of building software that's just inherently usable by people, right? So Discourse is doing some great stuff. We talk about things like Stack Exchange as well. And over the years, we've seen communication in open source just evolve, right? So, you know, uh, in the earlier days, people were using primarily IRC for kind of real-time communication. Some people were using mailing lists. A lot of people were using mailing lists. Occasionally, you see the odd forum cropping up. And these days we're seeing people more kind of interested in things like Slack um, and, and, you know, chat ups and whatever else is integrated in there. But then also some people are using forums like uh, Discourse is, uh, at least, you know, most of the people who I'm working with, people are really interested in Discourse. You know, it's like it's the new forum kind of technology as opposed to the crappy old ones. So, you know, there's a balance here. There's a few things here that I think are interesting. One element is like how are communication habits changing over the years? The second thing is, what is that balance between openness and convenience? So, for example, with Slack, you know, it's a, it's, it's a service, right? And you've got a back end there. There's alternatives like Mattermost. But where do you get the balance right for, for working on an open source project? And I thought this could be an interesting thing for us to dig into. Like, wh- what do we see as communication in open source projects over the next two or three years? And where do we think it's going? Sure. Did you want me to open? Because I have a few thoughts. I think you... <laughs> I, I, I imagine you have one or two thoughts on yeah. this topic. So. Yeah. Go so ahead. I, I think, you know, in general, I mean, one of the things that attracted me to the Discourse project was that it, it, this kind of forum type software is the building block of really any community that you're going to have online that doesn't actually belong to someone else. It's like one of the first decisions yeah. you have to make is, is am I okay if my community kind of belongs to someone else? In other words, you know, does it belong to Facebook? Does it belong to Twitter? Does it belong to Reddit? Um, because yeah. if you if you you can host stuff there, it's nothing wrong with that, and I think it's complimentary. I mean, sometimes you have to have it, right? You have to have a Facebook presence, whether you like it or not. These days, uh, the question is, you know, whether you know you own that. Does that really belong to you in that in that sense? And I think, especially for open source projects, they they really should have spaces that belong to them, because that's kind of the point of open source is like controlling what's happening such that you can control your destiny and be the thing that you want to be yeah. and not be controlled by other people's rules. So I think for any open source project, I think you're gonna, you kind of have to have your own space because that's what you're doing. That's what you're sending out to do. So one of the cautions I have is like, as much as I've always been kind of an IRC hater, like I've always really disliked IRC as a service, <laughs> as what it's doing, the types of interactions you have right. there. Let me just say I'm not a fan. <laughs> Uh, such that I remember when we started Stack Overflow, they were like, there was some guy on, on the Stack Overflow IRC that said he was Jeff Atwood, and he was really mean to me. And, he, and I was like, well, that wasn't me. You know, I don't go on IRC. You can just assume that if it's IRC, it's not going to be me, because I will not go there. I don't really like that style of interaction. And the tooling and stuff, everything about it is just kind of weird. So 
Slack being yeah. a reaction to IRC and saying, okay, we're going to take IRC and move it to the web, I'm actually a fan of. I think a lot of stuff needs to move to the web, and IRC kind of hasn't. I mean, yeah, you have HipChat and you have Campfire, and but those solutions were really kind of terrible. Like, they were never really very good, in my opinion. And Slack is the right. first one that came along and was actually kind of good. Like, it did all the UI right. You could edit things. Like, I knew HipChat was going wrong when I talked to... I actually went to Atlassian, and I was at the time we were using HipChat. And they were like, oh, any feedback for us on HipChat? I was like, yeah. I was like, I type something, and because I'm a human being, I make mistakes, and it's super hard to, like, edit my message. Now, I don't even know how IRC handles right. this, but you can. But they're like, oh, no problem. Just use that regular expression syntax of S slash phrase slash and i was like <laughs> oh, yeah. i was like dude you don't get it like if you're telling me he's s slash commands to edit what i just wrote like you don't get chat at all like you don't even understand how people work <laughs> because what i want to do is press up arrow and then you know use my cursor keys edit the thing i said and press enter that's what i want to do anything less than that it's just dumb like why would you do that so yeah, the, the existing solutions were not great. So I'm, on the one hand, I'm happy to see Slack uh, emerge as like a good uh, type of IRC taken to the web type of scenario. But it's kind of a bummer in that it's not really open source. The community doesn't really belong to you at that point. And also, chat is kind yeah. of not the right building block for community. It's something you need. It's real time. It's it's short. It's brief. You can type really, you know, you can keep things going like in real time. But I think the disconnected nature of time it's more valuable to you in a project like this. Like you don't necessarily want real time responses or even the expectation that people are going to give you real time responses to what you're doing. Uh, right. So it's kind of the wrong building block to start with. It's very complimentary to other stuff, right. but and it's very anyway, hard that, to search my, the archives. It's very hard to build an archive of knowledge over uh, an interface like that. Every time I talk about this, Mikel de Casa is like, I can search just fine. And he's like, he's had a lifetime of like working in IRC. So he's like mastered the skills of like making IRC right. searchable. I'm like, but regular humans do not do this. Like right. they cannot coherently hold a chat in such a way that it becomes searchable later. Like that is not a skill set what's, that human beings have, unless you're Miguel de Casa. What's interesting, what's interesting to me as well is, um, like I agree, I think I think you kind of need both. Like it, it's interesting that, um, for example, when I see the kind of conversations that occur on, I guess I guess you describe it as like batch messaging, whether it's mailing lists or whether it's forums or whether it's um, pull requests or issues, is they're often very focused, typically on a topic. Um, so it'll be a, a conversation about a feature or a problem or whatever it might be. One of the things that's interesting to me about about chat is that people are often a lot more social. Like people will show up in a chat channel and say, "Hey, you know, how are the kids doing?" or "What did you do at the weekend?" So I think it's nice. It serves a really nice purpose for that kind of water cooler function. But in my mind, any kind of structured communication, it doesn't work as well around unless you're in the reality distortion field of IRC. Like we used to use IRC a lot when I was at Canonical and we'd run like training sessions on IRC, which we thought was the greatest, most innovative idea at the time. <laughs> it's like completely incompatible with humanity. <laughs> right. So it's interesting how these different communication mechanisms do kind of lend themselves to different types of discussion in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the analogy I like to use is if you've seen the Pixar movie Inside Out, which is great, by the way, everybody should see it if you haven't seen it. It's legitimately a great movie, yep. like most Pixar stuff, except for cough, uh, Cars 2, apparently. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Inside <laughs> Out has this concept of long-term memory and short-term memory. You, you form these memories. There's these little colored balls, right. good memories, bad memories, different feelings. And they make a decision inside your head, like, does this go into long-term memory or does this go into short-term memory? Because the expectation is you actually forget things in short-term memory. The definition of being insane is remembering every single thing that happens to you every day. Like, you forgetting is oh, kind geez. of a feature of being a human being. And I think people being computer geeks are like, no, we must remember everything. And I initially thought this as well. When we built the chat solution for Stack Exchange, I was like, well, of course, this is a permanent record. And I remember people walking in early on and going, oh, God, this is on the permanent record forever and searchable. It's like, I'm out of here. And I was like, I didn't even understand. I was like, right. why would you have that attitude? <laughs> now I think I have a deeper understanding of why that is, because forgetting is kind of a feature of the short-term memory. And you actually want to make a distinction when you're having a memory, you're like, oh, we really need to remember this. You need to make a, a conscious decision to ship it over to long-term memory, whatever that is for your project. Like, we 
often position discourses. This is like, okay, you're having a product discussion, you're brainstorming, and then you get down to brass tacks. Like, how are we actually going to do this stupid thing that we're proposing we do? Then you need to go to a structured format like discourse where the, the unit of work is not the word. It's more like the sentence or the paragraph. You're having complete thoughts and you're doing them in sequence, whereas chat is like this interweaving of narratives at the word level, which is incredibly difficult to tease out. You know, it's great for brainstorming. It's great for like, you know, ad hoc, just stuff is happening, you know, how's it going? Yeah, shooting the shit. Yeah, ops, yeah. all that. It's great for that, but it's terrible for telling a story. For telling a story, Chad is probably literally the worst tool you could choose. And telling a story is how human beings survive in the world. You know, you have to be able to tell stories about what's happening to you, what you're building, what you plan to do. If you can't tell a coherent story around that, then you're just basically doomed. So, I feel like if you're using chat, <laughs> you're kind of teaching yourself actually all the wrong skills for actually running a project, which is to tell the story. Yeah. To tell the story is so fundamental to doing any kind of project, right? And you're, that's why you, you need both. You need the long-term memory and the short-term memory. You can't have just short-term memory. That doesn't actually make any sense, right? That, well, and that, I think kind of back to Jono's point about chat excelling kind of at that back channel and, and kind of water cooler stuff, there's almost an expectation that a lot of those conversations are supposed to be ephemeral, right? That's what they are. Yes. So yeah, uh, and, ha having them catalyzed yeah. in that way is kind of just goes against what you think should happen. Right. And and so, sort of private. As you say, I mean, it's not that people are immediately thinking, well, this stuff is obviously completely secret, but there's an expectation that they won't necessarily show up in an archive two years from now and have some, you have someone quote your words back against you. You say, well, I wasn't writing for publication there. The thing that... The thing that I find is that the... Um, overextending the short-term and long-term analogy, memory analogy... I don't explicitly think to myself, this thing that's happening right now, I must commit this to long-term memory. There's some kind of not very well understood brain thing that puts things that are important in long-term memory without me explicitly doing it. And at the moment, I think there's too big a divide between the short-term chat and the long-term go and write a sensible discourse post or something like that. Um, write something on the forum. I'd like to be able to get into a conversation and then have a button to press, which just says, make this into a post on the forum. So I've got a question. I can ask for answers. I get those answers immediately. So I get the immediate gratification rather than waiting until tomorrow for an answer. But then that answer becomes available to other people searching six months from now. But in some kind of magic automated process. And nobody's cracked, nobody's <clears throat> cracked this yet. So this you want like a getter integration where you is... could turn something you were chatting in into, say, a discourse thread? Yeah, but you don't want to. You, what you don't want to do is just post the chat log because chat logs are half ephemeral. They are a crappy way of learning information. I want something which can read the chat log and turn it into the post I should have written instead. Oh, well, you're going to be waiting a while. It's, it, 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 <laughs> Harder than it <laughs> it's looks. It's interesting to me don't because. Get me wrong. <laughs> What's interesting, a couple of things that strike me here as well is that I think open source itself is, is, is adjusting and adapting in different ways. Like, again, just thinking back to some of the earlier days in Ubuntu, you know, there was just an implicit kind of like, not a rule, just a view that everything should be archived, that, um, you know, transparency and openness is so non-negotiable that everything should be archived. And one of the few, one, one of the early cases that really challenged that was actually when the Ubuntu women project was set up and a bunch of members in that, in that team said, we don't want our channel like, um, archiving, you know, we don't want that, those, those that content, that content made available on, you know, on public web pages. Cause there may be some private conversations that are occurring there. It was designed to be this kind of like safe environment for people. And it strikes me that as open source has evolved, particularly with the impact of GitHub, which we've talked about in, uh, previously in the show, like some of these kind of like long held hardcore beliefs in, in some of the, those early open source projects seem to have loosened up a little bit, you know, well, where you don't necessarily need to record every conversation. The, the, um, and I, don't I quite the, like the idea that you have. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I don't know that they've loosened up necessarily, but I think especially giving the time period of when you started at Canonical, which is a while ago now, I think the expectation then was that most people that were really hardcore into open source were technical people. And in 2017, I don't think that's the case. 
I think our notion... Uh, I, I, th- I think maybe also our notion of transparency has changed. I think... Um, 15 years ago when we started to get into this um if you looked at if you said okay we want to be transparent and open we want we want to be we want it to be obvious to people that we're not doing shady secret stuff behind closed doors no one knew a way of doing that other than say you can see absolutely everything that we do there's no notion of trust right (laughs) so Jeff, I have a question for you about this because you've you've spent a lot of a lot of your life building these kinds of systems, right? You've, you've thought a lot about. I know that I remember do, seeing a talk that you gave at a conference in San Francisco, and you kind of look at your work in many ways as almost like building a multiplayer game for how people communicate and collaborate around each other. I think there's something interesting in that notion of like an idea starting out in a pub or at a water cooler. Uh, online and then it going through the necessary steps to evolve into a more structured idea that people can wrap their heads around like do you think that's do you think it's possible to kind of uh, that an idea can go from that disorganized thought in someone's head through to you know that fully fleshed out thing that can then turn into code in a way that is kind of like community driven as opposed to just having a really opinionated person who pushes it through which is how it often happens well i think the the you brought up a good point about earlier about like turning chat logs into a structured post, and I think there is something to be done there, but it's hard to automate because again, the interweaving is so deep in the conversations, right? And God forbid you have two conversations going on at the same time between two other people like that are unrelated at the same time, which does happen in these chat rooms, right? Then you have right, two right. different narratives going on at the same time. So you can kind of target people. You can say, okay, give me everything in the room that was this person, this person, this person from, you know, either a lull, you know, which there are lulls. You can measure from lull to lull when people stop talking to uh, just arbitrary times, yeah. like the last 10 minutes of me and Jono talking, for example. So th- it is possible right. to do that. But I-, I think it's almost better to view... Uh, chat is like a first draft of like brainstorming session of what you really want to get to. And then you retell the story uh, using those as kind of footnotes, like like scanning through it manually. I mean, this is the, this would be a manual process. I mean, I agree. Yes. If, if we had a magical, you know, again, this is an AI problem. If you had the AI that could actually figure all this stuff out and flesh out your thoughts and actually write them like a writer would. Uh, but that's a really, really difficult yeah. <laughs> problem. So I think the best way, to, in my opinion, to do this is to have the brainstorming sessions in chat. Those are very valuable. It's a great tool for brainstorming. And then just kind of scroll through and use that as a first draft. So you, you're you not writing from scratch, from first principles, like, now I shall write with a blank page. I'm going to write from first principles everything I think about this. No, you just scan through chat. It's like, oh, yeah, this, then this, then this. And you, you know, you, you weave the story, story together based on your notes. Those are your notes for the story. The chat is your notes for the story that you're going to tell. And it is easier to write that way. It still works. So, you know, somebody's not going to like to yeah. do it. But it's easier work than just from first principles, blank page, create you know, a story. Yeah. yeah. So that's, do that's kind think, of my recommendation. Uh, where do you think, where, where do we think that this is kind of going, like, where do we see it in, let's say five years? Like, do we think that, that primarily it's going to be this kind of mixture of, <clears throat> um, like right now, like I say, we've got this mixture of like a typical open source project. will have a mixture of chat. They'll have maybe a forum. They'll maybe, they'll have issues. What do you guys think is going to, be the state of things in the next five years or so? Like, do you think it's going to be an iteration of that? Or do you think, I mean, do we think VR? I don't, oh, God, I mean, shut up about VR. VR. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I know, I'm, I'm saying, I did give it the caveat that, like, it's probably not going to yes, happen. Yes, what, what I want to do um, when I have a know, question what, about a JavaScript library is to get it through some stupid augmented reality interface. Shut up. I just want to just write my question in a text you're just, box. <laughs> Well, you're just angry because my Facebook VR predictions actually coming <laughs> true, right? Um, I Ooh, think I, I think as as we've all basically said here, there are two different needs. There's the there's the need for um, instant gratification, answers to questions where you can interact in real time, you can clarify things, so on and so forth, um, and and that also serves the need for interpersonal relationships within the project right completely separately and then you've got the more kind of writing for publication writing for posterity the whole newspaper of record kind of feel of writing on the mailing list or the forum and writing something carefully written and seasoned and a first and second and third draft and so on and 
those two needs are not going to go away, right? I mean, this is not a thing which is unique to open source projects. I'm sure whoever designed the pyramids had to do it the same way. <laughs> I, I think you're gonna, my guess would be you're going to see a, a, an expectation that more things are integrated in a better way than they are now across the board, right? Because now if an right. open source so, you know, project does have a mailing list and a forum and a chat, they're completely, completely disparate, where I think there's going to be an expectation that they're integrated in some meaningful way that's useful that maybe hasn't been exactly nailed down yet. But it seems almost inexorable right. that that will happen. And I think there's going to be within the next five years, maybe not within the next 10 years, I think so. As services that are integral start to go away because business models fail, I think you're going to see an expectation that more of these infrastructure pieces are open sourced. Even if there's like discourse where you can hire discourse to host it, if they were to go away, you also have the code. And I think that's going to start to be an expectation. That's going to be table stakes at some point, I think. <laughs> right. When you say that, that, that was, that was think, a long Jeff? sentence, which is when Slack dies, everyone's screwed, right? <laughs> Well, there's yeah, a couple that is a examples concern. I can think of, but <laughs> but I gotta tell you the thing. I, I, I worry. Well, not worry is not the right word. I'm actually I'm thinking that Slack is not unassailable in the sense that. Let me give you an example. Like on our project on Discourse, we're a remote team. We're in like I don't know how many nine different countries, eight different time zones, ridiculously disparate team, right? All over the world, literally all over the world. So this kind of live chat is essential to our, again, short-term memory. Like, yeah. This is the only way we, we see and yeah. talk to each other all day long. We don't go to the same office. We see each other once a year. There are yearly meetups. So it's an essential tool. And yet, we've switched chat clients three times. And every time we did, we technically kept an archive of the history, but we essentially threw it away. Like We've never referred to that history, even once. So chat is the kind right. of tool where right. you can just throw away all your history, and it's, it's no big deal. Because of the nature of chat, it's so yeah, hard the lock -in is definitely to make this into a searchable narrative that it's very, very easy to switch. So I think that's good news for people that are worried about, okay, Slack's going to lock people in this proprietary container, oh. which I think is a legitimate concern. Now, that's but interesting. But it's so easy to just walk away. It's so easy to walk away. I, so the next... I, and, I disagree I mean, GitLab that. basically copied... GitHub, right? GitLab, I mean, they've done some more since then. But essentially, from the beginning, they were like, we're just going to clone GitHub. Right? That basically, that's what they did. Right. And I think people are going to do that to Slack and, and in an open source way like GitLab does. So to, there's, well, there's your option. Well, to a large extent, that, that, that's that has happened. Mass, yeah, mass Git mostly that. Git to do that and GitLab have, in fact, just bought Git, haven't they? Um, yes. and, there's, and there's Rocket yep. Chat and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not sure I agree about the sheer ephemerality of um, chat conversations. So because there are archives and because the chat's easy to do, I have a number of times now been bitten by thinking, oh, um, I need that bit of information, that document, that write-up that someone did. They just posted it on Slack. I'll go and get it from there. No one ever bothered to put it anywhere else because it was posted on Slack and Slack's got archive. But it was over 10,000 messages ago. And now Slack are holding it to ransom. So I think... I, that's, that's not a bad point, actually. I, yeah, because I, 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 I do think, the same thing exactly, with Google Chat I think the problem will become that as people adapt to this idea that chat is a good... I mean, people didn't do... People only did ephemeral stuff on IRC because if you post a thing on IRC, it was gone the following day. You had to take a copy of it or whatever. Slack, the stuff's there when you refer to it the next day, the day after that. So why bother saving the document? You just go and fish it out of the Slack archives right up until you collide with their business model. And I wonder how much people will adapt to this idea that Slack is not ephemeral. Well, but they're actually teaching people. Huh. I mean, people are people love free, first of all, right? Like they love, they hate paying for things, and they love free. So, so many projects and so many people are going to learn. Hey, just don't put anything in here that's going to disappear after ten thousand messages. In other words, that short term to long term memory uh, division that I talked about, they're going to learn that. Oh, well, if it's something we really need to remember, let's move it to this other tool that isn't Slack, which is what they should be doing anyway. So, ironically, Slack is actually teaching people not to use Slack in an inappropriate way as long term memory, which I think is, I don't think they're right. trying to do. I think it's completely accidental, but it actually is very, very healthy to view chat that way. Right. If you start viewing chat as like the permanent record, you're right. That's when you start to get screwed, not just because of Slack's model, but because good luck searching for anything in that stuff. I mean, I've had conversations because Stuart Butterfield, 
apparently follows me on Twitter, and he paid attention to some things I was saying about this, not necessarily directed towards Slack, but like just the general unsearchability of, of chat. Like even when I've tried to do it, it's like something I knew was there that we discussed like a couple days ago. I was like, oh my god, it was just so much. It was so hard to get that information. Yeah. Not because Slack is bad, but because the problem is just it's the wrong unit of work for what you're trying to do. And he maintained, and him and Miguel yeah. de Casa are like, oh, we can totally search chat. And I was like, well, you have superhuman abilities of structure then, because unless it was a private conversation, the only time I can find stuff in, in chat or Slack is if it's a private conversation. When I don't tend to have that many private conversations. So those archives last a little bit longer, and they're more directed. What was the last private thing I said to, say, Jono, for example? That is easy right. to find. And beyond that, right. I was just right. hosed. There was just no way yeah. I was going to find the thing. So Yeah, Bobby, well, I'm, exactly- I'm curious to see what our... I was going to say, I, I'm, I'm curious to see what our community thinks of this. Um, so, you know, using a discourse forum. <laughs> or you can, actually, we don't really have a chat channel, so that's good. Uh, but yeah, go to uh, community.badvoltage.org. Let us know what you think. Like, where do you think this is going? I'd be curious to hear what people think in terms of, um, you know, where these existing tools are going to go like where is slack going where is discourse going uh you know what's going to be the function of video calling or whatever else but also like what that you know how you thread that conversation through different parts of the development process like how you go from an idea in someone's head to 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 something that people can run go to community.badvoltage.org and let us know what you think An interesting new move from Google Home. Google Home is the thing that sits in your house and listens to everything you say and uploads it all to the internet, like Amazon's Alexa or Mycroft or whatever. Um, And we've, in the last uh, couple of weeks, Google Home has started essentially providing adverts for things. Um, Disney released the new Beauty and the Beast film. And And the Google Home device... In between it telling you the time and telling you what the news headlines were, it would basically say, hey, you should go and watch Beauty and the Beast. And a whole bunch of people said, dude, that's an advert. Don't do that. That's a terrible thing to do. Why are you doing ads for this film that I'm not interested in? And Google have sort of hand wave about it and said, no, 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 it's not about, it's not an advert. We're just telling you about things that we think you'll be interested in. Now, this is, I mean, obviously the thing here is it's just another ad-funded product. And unlike Alexa, whose basic goal is to get you to buy stuff from Amazon, Google don't have a whole warehouse full of things that you might want to buy. So they've got to monetize this stuff somehow. And one way they're doing this is just it's just another channel for them to present ads to you. But what do we think? Is this actually an okay thing to do? It, it feels to me like the expectations change is what's broken here. People did not expect this to be another channel for ads, and right. suddenly it is, and that's so, a surprise. So to clarify, it was during the – you can ask it how your day is going to be, and it gives you weather, your calendar, and stuff. And at the end of that, it tacked on, by the way, Disney's live-action Beauty and the Beast opens today. And I think their first official response might be the cheekiest response I've ever seen from a company that big. It was, quote-unquote, this isn't an ad. The beauty in The Assistant is that it invites our partners to be our guests and share their talent. So why that's or share their tales, sorry. Why that's funny is two things. It was for Beauty and the Beast, and they said the Beauty and the Assistant. And Disney's tagline is "Be our guest." So Be they used guest, the tagline for the, the company yeah. in the response. <laughs> that is double hilarious, and I don't think most people even caught on to it. But then their second, they, their official response was that it wasn't intended to be an ad, and uh, they were circulating part of our uh, information they thought would be helpful about your day, and we sometimes call out timely content. So. I think it's a, they claimed they weren't paid. I haven't seen them say definitely that they weren't, but I think there is an expectation with this product that it won't just read ads out to you. What's, what's interesting to me about this is, is um, like when, when a service recommends things that I care about, it's really helpful and I enjoy that recommendation, but when it's not helpful, it's an ad. 
<laughs> so for example, I've been using, since I got the Google Pixel phone, I've been using Google now quite a bit uh, and I really like it and, it and it recommends things to me. Um, but for example, it recommends articles that I might be interested in based upon what I've been reading about. And you could arguably suggest, I mean, it's not an ad because it's not a company paying money to make that thing appear necessarily. But, you know, if I see a recommendation for me to go and read uh, a Washington Post article, um, it doesn't really matter from my perspective whether that company paid for that for, for that to appear so long if, if i find it interesting i find it interesting so to me this is all about wait how it matches wait to wait wait wait, wait, wait. hang on you so you're of the opinion what? that the google people they weren't paid by disney to do this they just sat around in google headquarters and went wow you know what beauty and the beast is such a good film that we should tell everyone about no. it just because it's brilliant no 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 <laughs> no what i'm saying what i'm saying is that recommendation to me wouldn't be interesting because i don't care about watching beauty and the beast right but if they for example um if a movie came out recently uh, you know that i do care about that is the kind of thing that i would want to go and watch let's say good example robocop 6 right is released right which is a brilliant movie franchise if the, if 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 my google now or someone else, or something else said hey by the way robocop 6 is going to be playing in you know in walnut creek this week, uh, and you have a slot in your calendar on Saturday, I'd find that quite useful. So that's what I'm saying is that to me, it's all about like how relevant this is to e- to the yeah. Person. But there's no business model there, right? If um, what what there totally is a business nah, model. What there. Google want you to do? What Google want to happen is the people who made RoboCop six go to Google and say, "We'll give you money in exchange for advertising RoboCop six. If RoboCop six gets advertised to everyone who wants it anyway, why would I, the producer of the film, bother paying?" <laughs> No, what you do is, like, look, if you can... I mean, this is how advertising companies are operating, right? It's it's highly targeted ads, so they don't feel like ads, right? Spamming people with with a product is not good, and I agree with that in all contexts, right? But if you can basically say, we know that this, this 5,000 people, for example, in this area will be really interested in this particular message, then I think that's that would be a good thing for the studio and that would be a good thing for the users. But it's really about Google needing to integrate and monetize ads in a way that doesn't compromise utility and doesn't compromise trust. And that's really difficult to do with a product like this, I think. Yes. I don't see it as any different to ads that you see on a computer. Well, oh, one other thing about this is that um, a de- a- an audio device is inherently serial. Right? While it's playing you an ad, it can't be doing anything else. Whereas something like the Google Assistant or whatever, it can just put up a little notification in the background, which you can look at when you want to. It's not delaying the other thing you're doing. If you've got text yeah, ads down the side of a page, then they're there for you to look at. If you want to, you can look at that after you've read the main thing, whatever. Part of the reason that everyone hates those stupid pop-up banners, which go up in front of a page, and st- is because they take over the page. They block you from reading. Audio right. ads by definition, do the same thing. Yeah, I, I agree. So you'd want that content to be even more necessary and focused than anything else, right? I think the tolerance level for these audio devices will be, you know, you know, way different to the tolerance level that people are going to have on a web page, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, because if, if you don't want this thing to start blathering on at you. But this is the challenge with these devices anyway, is that, you know, Erica and I, for example, she's got an iPhone, I've got a Google Pixel. We did a comparison between um, OK Google. Oh, <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and Siri. And one of the downsides of mm, Google <laughs> is the fact that it tends to overread stuff out because it's obviously yanking like the first paragraph from, uh, from a Wikipedia article or something like that. So it's like, okay, dude, we get the drift. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it tends to go on a little too much. But that's to me, is where, where this is interesting. It's like, what is the right balance in terms of how much content should be read out and how targeted it is? Because if, if they get that balance right, and I can't think of another company that's better set up to do that than Google with all the information they've got about everybody, then I think it could be worthwhile. I don't know. What do you think, Jeff? Well, I think you kind of have both hit on some interesting things, which is it is interruptive, so the the bar is higher for sure. While you're doing that, you can't do anything else. It's the serial stream of audio data that's coming at you, right? Like you're talking to a person. But there's a big difference between talking to a person who actually understands you 
and knows what you like, and someone who's treating you as generic human being that I am now interacting with. So I think <laughs> right. to the extent that you know these tools can actually learn to understand who you are, and this is the I think the side of advertising that actually people get freaked out about, but I, I think is actually healthy. Is it's actually better for them to know a little bit about you so that the ads aren't complete shit, right? right. I mean, that's the problem. It's not that there's ads; it's the ads are shitty. They don't like talk to me as a person. They're for Beauty and the Beast. Like, I don't care about Beauty and the Beast, but gosh, you know, the new Judge Dredd movie came out. Holy crap, I'm super on board, right? Uh, <laughs> right. And that's the difference between talking to someone. It's like getting a gift from someone that doesn't even know you and doesn't even care about you. They give you some generic gift that like, oh God, you know, why did you yeah. even bother doing this? Versus somebody that actually knows you, knows what you like, and got you something they knew you would like and you did like. And that's a very nice interaction, right? Like, why can't AIs, you know, whatever ad tech we're working on, eventually evolve to that? Now, one thing I want to mention is a lot of advertising that I see on Google now is what, what's called retargeting, which is it knows I've been to a certain site and it knows I bought something there or that I like that I've been looking at that stuff and it will just serve me the stuff that I was just yeah. looking at, which is... Better than nothing and better than wrong ads, but also kind of yeah. annoying. Like, it'll serve me ads for stuff. I've already bought this. Like, stop showing me yeah. ads for retargeting for sh crap I've already purchased. Yeah. Um, but it's in the right ballpark, right? They're trying to s okay, that stuff clearly I like because I bought it, right? At least it's correct at some level. It, it's even, it's yeah. even more annoying when the thing you bought is a present. You buy... I bought my I, I oh, bought yeah. my mum some shoes and then shoes followed me around the internet for two weeks <laughs> afterwards. I'm like, I didn't even want these in the first damn place. Stop advertising them to me. God knows what the you know, the collection of my preferences thinks that I like when I do this kind of thing. Right. Yeah, imagine how hard of a problem that is. I mean, we joke about, you know, if you work if you work at Google, you'll be start working on advertising your whole life. But it's actually kind of an interesting problem in the sense of it's almost like AI if you get it right. Um, it's yeah. really hard. I mean, I, and I think um, part of the issue is that, yes, the idea that we should know something about you and therefore target the ads is a good one. But no one knows how to do that other than basically hoovering up every single piece of data we can find about a person. And if a, a thing which actually knew you would know that you'd find that a little bit disquieting. <laughs> well, that's... Yeah, yeah and that, I guess the challenge... The challenge here as well is, you know, so for example, when we were preparing for the Bad Voltage live show, right, um, we bought Alan Rabinovich, who had been on every live show as our applause guy, and we put him in a stupid outfit each time, and we put him in a gold-colored MC Hammer outfit. We did. <laughs> and uh, consequently, like, M like basically 80s-themed um costumes have been following me around the internet for a while and i want to be able to say i want incognito mode for like this is something that i'm just buying temporarily in the same way that yeah if i buy <laughs> if i if i buy erica a pe like a pair of shoes I, I don't wear women's shoes okay <laughs> so you're saying that 80s hammer outfit is not your life's work it's not the right. culmination of everything that you are as a person is that is what you're saying? So you, it's a culmination uh, are you I sure, are you sure? That one, to be fair ah uh, well <laughs> exactly. this is exactly it you know so now john is spending his whole life looking at adverts for hammer pants and Christian Labatan shoes that he can't afford. It's <laughs> the incognito I'm mode. I'm really terrified to see this Google You thing. do need to look in your list of, uh, uh, of um, you know, preferences and so on and so forth. That'd be really interesting. And then you should, and then you should publish it on the forum. Do it, man. All right, I'll do that. I'll do the that. brave soul. Maybe. But I am sympathetic. So for people that I used to run ad blockers, and I'll tell you when I stopped. I stopped when I started working on advertisements for Stack Overflow because early on, we told the committee, look, there's going to be ads. Like, I don't want to get anyone to get the understanding that this is going to be completely ad-free for the rest of your life. Like, we want to start experimenting with this early on so that we set expectations yeah. with the community. But, you know, nice ads, like not animated, yeah. appropriate to the audience, that sort right. of thing. And when I was testing ads, the funniest thing is testing ads with an ad blocker because you're like, why isn't this working? <laughs> like, because your ad blocker is blocking it. And then I realized, like, how hypocritical it was for me to run an ad blocker. I mean, I don't want to get on a high horse or whatever, but it just seemed wrong. It's like, here I am doing ads, and yet I'm running an ad blocker. It's like, well, that's not right. Like, I I don't run ad blockers. Like, I'm sympathetic to the argument that the ads are bad, the ads eat up my battery, all that stuff, or CPU, whatever you want to look at. But on the other hand, like, people have a right to make a living, and it's not... Doing yeah. ads pr 
properly or at least decently is not total rocket science. Like showing programmer related ads on Stack Overflow is not rocket science. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, so if you're on a video game site, showing ads for video games is appropriate and not in any way offensive in lo- unless they're like literally blocking your whole screen or whatever. And to be, and to be know, honest with yeah. you, that ship has sailed now. We have collectively as a society decided that we want to fund things by showing ads. It's a crappy way of doing things, yeah. but we're stuck with it now. I don't think it is a crappy way of doing things. Put it this way, right? I... I have my own business now, and pretty much everything that I do lives in a bunch of Google services, right? I pay nothing for that. I click on an ad every so often. I see ads from time to time. Like, if, if, I would have, if, if someone would have said to me 15 years ago, you know what, you'll have access to loads of free services that offer tons of value to your life um, in exchange for looking at the odd ad from time to time and maybe clicking on it, I, I'd say that. Seems like a brilliant idea to me. I think ads are a really good thing. I'm, this is one of the reasons why I don't run an ad blocker. Like, this is the lifeblood of how the internet operates. What we need is not fewer ads. We need better ads. In my mind. So. Yeah, and if you can't see them, how can you provide any feedback on that, right? right? Exactly. So, I mean, again, I don't want to get on a high horse because there's this very political issue. A lot of people have very strong feelings about ads. Like, they hate spam and they hate ads. And right. I get that. But it's like, you're not being sort of a citizen of this ecosystem unless you're actually subscribing and i actually pay i was happy youtube did this youtube red apparently it's not doing well but they have a subscription right. service which does remove all the ads yeah. i was like holy crap this is what i've been asking right. for the first thing i did was click the buy button i was like click 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 i actually bought it on ios and web so i bought it twice actually because <laughs> i wanted to support this idea that i'm paying so that i don't have to look at all these stupid ads because right. What makes me crazy on YouTube is like the 15 second ad on the 30 second video clip that I don't watch. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, like <laughs> it's so wrong that I have to sit for 15 seconds, watch an ad for a whole clip. This will be like less than 30 seconds. So wrong. But anyway, I jumped on YouTube Red because I was like, that's what I wanted them to do. Yeah. I want to, I want to support things with subscriptions and then, you know, get rid of the ads. Like that's what we should be moving towards if that's what the goal yeah, this is. is. This, this yeah. is the pinball A generalized thing, right? micropayment thing has also been right around the corner forever now. Yeah, and I'm not pushing too hard for it. I think it'd be great if it happened, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, this is um, what uh, Pinboard goes on. Um, uh, then um, Mache wrote, don't be a free user for exactly this reason. Because what happens is that your service that you like a lot will die because they don't have any money. Oh, yeah. Um, on right. the other hand, Google Home, not free of charge, right? The thing costs $129. And I don't yeah, think... Yeah, but I mean, why is it valuable? I would, I would, I'm sure, but yeah, but you've paid something for it. I'm sure they would say it's just like a television, right? You don't buy a television and then go, well, I've paid for it now. I don't get to watch any ads on the t- TV. But it's it, it's not like your thing where you spent, fine, I've just signed up for Google Docs and then occasionally I'll watch an ad. You've already given them a bunch of money to put this thing in your house. I, 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 I get where you're coming from in this, <laughs> but to me, like, this is an academic argument, right? It's just the value of the whole, I mean, you know, the, these Google Home devices, it's basically giving you access to a, a network of knowledge and, 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 and content, right? <laughs> and what it's doing is it, you're buying the interface. You're not buying, you know, you, you, you don't necessarily impact the actual service itself like it like i don't even know if google offer this if there was a way in which you could basically pay money and not see any ads on the internet then go and buy you that can pay to they, they, google they, they, yeah google contributor yeah that was google contributor they tried no one signed up for it and oh, they that's killed right, it yeah oh is it already right they already killed I think, that i did not know that did, did, well did it's weird did, google didn't kill services they didn't didn't they say didn't, didn't they do their <laughs> it's dying in a year it's now deprecated don't do it thing I don't think it's actually dead yet, but it was coughing up blood last night, like half the other Google services. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I also I also wonder how many people actually care about ads. I mean, a lot of people in the technology community get very you know uppity about about this topic in in different ways, right? But I mean, last fifteen minutes is a good example of that. But um, I, you know, my dad. I don't think he even knows. Well, I think a lot of the problem just... with the current ad ecosystem is so, so often malware or other things get into that system or it's yeah. so intrusive that that is really more of the issue. Like Jeff said, if, if advertising was of high quality, I, I don't think it would be nearly the issue it is now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I but I, but I, run, I don't run ad blockers, right? And I don't, I mean, granted, my stuff is all up to date because I'm a geek and whatnot. And I, I, I guess 
it does happen, but I think the the, the bad ad, the the malware ad, is a little bit overblown in the sense that if you visit non sketchy sites, now if you're going to sketchy corners of the internet, I make no promises. <laughs> There's a lot of weird things that can happen that I'm not going to speak for. But if you're visiting sort of mainstream sites, I I argue that this is really very very statistically unlikely. I mean, I don't think that's a really common thing to get yeah. malware in certain ads. Yeah. I I I completely agree with that. Like my personal experience pretty much maps that. But of course, I have never been to a sketchy part of the internet no, not once. So um, I neither. Ask him for never. a friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> only the good parts, the safe parts, the <laughs> Disney safe. part. The Disney. Only Disney dot com. In fact, that's the only site I go to. <laughs> So that was the show. That was an interesting show. <laughs> yeah, interesting show. Jeff has sailed off into the sunset because he had to get on something else. His, but we, his, uh, his stack has, in fact, overflowed, so he's gone. It did never say that again. <laughs> uh, but that, that will never. You should ever, lose ever mic ever privileges for like ninety seconds for that. <laughs> right, seriously. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Jeff, for joining us. You know, smart dude, a lot of fun. Yeah, that was um, a good conversation. I think so. You know, yeah. So it's always good to have him on. Always welcome back on Bad Voltage. We should talk about the live show a little bit. We should. We just did it. And the uh, the video's out. Um, so if you didn't come and see us at the uh, Scale Conference in Pasadena, you can go to uh, badvoltage.org and you can go and get the video. Um, you also might want to subscribe to our YouTube feed, uh, which is Bad Voltage Show. Um, and you can get all the new episodes of the show pushed out there. We're also going to be doing maybe a little bit of experimentation with video. We'll see what happens. But... Uh, yeah, and I just want to say a big thank you to Matt. Uh, I think it's Matthew Green who shot and edited the show for us. Yes. He did a really good job. So um, he job, was there man. with his three enormous cameras. Also, big thank you, big thank you to Ticketmaster to uh, for for just helping to put the whole the, the whole show together that evening. You know they. They had the band come out, they rented the venue, they provided the food and the drinks. We ran out of beer, and we ran out of tacos. <laughs> uh, we we, 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 we ran out of beer, and then they brought more beer in, and then we ran out of beer again. <laughs> yeah, which I believe is a testament to uh, to a Bad Volta show. Uh, also, thank you to Lino for, to, for for helping to get us all out there. They they, they put a, a, a ginger man on a plane with they a ginger did. suit. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you to Dell as well. We'll talk more about that in a second. Of course, our friends at Scale for, for hosting us. We always we, we love all of those guys and uh, and girls. And then thank you to Endless for providing an Endless uh, Mission 1, which we gave out in the show. Uh, Brian Lundig ended up winning it, and then he gave it away. <laughs> so, he did, but he gave it, he, I might add, yeah. He, yeah, gave it to yeah. Computers for Kids, which was a very cool thing to which do, was in my opinion. A very, very, very cool thing to do. So, especially, uh, especially since we were quite mean about him earlier in the show, so he uh, didn't have to do that. If by we, you mean, you mean you two, then, then yes. You oh! Hey, don't bring me into this shit shit fest hey well we'll have less of this whole no we just planned it and they didn't say it so it's just me well just chuck me under the bus peeps i would less of that it, it was just you i i had nothing to do with it i don't ever remember jeremy and i really talking talking about this you just oh, really dick. That's, <laughs> well, that's basically the the executive summary of this situation this is this is not in question however <laughs> we should we should talk yeah. about we should talk about the competition Yes. Should. Do you want to go on then? You, you redeem yourself, language. Right. Okay. So, um, if you uh, we've just mentioned the live show, you should go to badvoltage.org slash live if you want to watch it, or go to us on YouTube. And as Jono says, you should follow us on YouTube, which apparently is a thing that people can do. Um, Neve, she said, I saw the live show, and I'm like, how did you know we put the live show out? And she said, oh, I follow you on YouTube. She's a subscriber. So if my daughter's doing this, you should all be doing it as well. Go you and subscribe. just discovered that you can subscribe to <laughs> channels on YouTube. Well, I don't watch YouTube. don't know how to respond to that. You're like Clint Eastwood talking to an empty chair. <laughs> Jesus Christ, dude. I've, I, up to the this point, The web version of that is Eck talking to a monitor that's off. <laughs> up until this point, I've never found anyone where I think, okay, I'm prepared to get advised about your next video because I think it will be good. <laughs> right? uh, YouTube is surprisingly good at recommending things to people, uh, but it's not a recommendation. It's obviously an ad. It's an ad. So there you go. <laughs> um, but yes. So if you go and watch the show, go to badvoltage.org slash live if you want to watch it. Um, you will notice that over the course of the live show, we mentioned the names of lots and lots of different kinds of fruit. 
right? An inordinate yeah. amount of fruit, really. Inordinate amount of fruit. If And then what you should do is, every time we mention a piece of fruit, you should write down the name of that piece of fruit and the time at which we did it. And then if you go to badvoltage.org slash fruit, there is a form you can fill in. And if you fill in that form and you na- and you put in all the times we mentioned fruit and when we did it and send it off to us and you get all the answers right and we pick your name out of the hat, what do you win? So you're going to win a 2017 Dell Sputnik. Um, and this is uh, Dell's developer laptop. Um, it's got a seventh generation Intel Core i7. It comes uh, pre-installed with Ubuntu 1604 LTS. 16 gig of memory. Um, it's got a 13.3 inch QHD plus Infinity Edge touch display. That's a, a resolution of 3200 by 1800. And it's got a 512 gig PCIe solid state drive. It's a really nice looking machine as well. Uh, that, I say, have that, you I think... the one we used on stage back to uh, Barton George? And, and thanks again to Barton for lending us that one. Yep. Uh, it's a really nice machine. That, yeah, that I think really is the key is. thing. I mean, yes, it's power. It's a powerful machine. It's got all the things you need, round and to all that kind of thing. But it's just so nice to look at. You're like, oh, oh that's, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. So be sure to go and uh, so if you want to enter this, like, yeah, you just got to go through. Um, you got to go and uh, you know go through and and list all of the different fruits that were mentioned in the show. You can go to badvoltage.org slash fruit <laughs> <laughs> to, to enter this. Um, and then, uh, and then yeah, they, they submit it, and we'll pick your name out of a hat, and you can win it. And it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's a pretty killer prize. Thank you so much, Dell, for, for, uh, for, for giving it to us to give away. We really appreciate it. Um, also, I would like to see, just as a separate thing, it's got nothing to do with the competition, I would like to see someone take a picture from the live show where the three of us stood on the stage, and then for each of those different fruits, Photoshop in all of those fruits like they were sat on the stage. I just, I just like to see what they all look like. I don't know what half of watching. them are. You named a bunch well, of yeah, fruits. Because I've at one point, you OK of. Googled list of weird fruits and then read them out. <laughs> yeah, the African horned melon or whatever. The African horned so. melon. Well, yeah. So what you should do is, yes, if you're going to Photoshop these things into place, ideally put them all on Jeremy's head like Carmen Miranda. That'd be excellent. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I revise my request to the community. Please do that. So, so. I get the nanopus and I get the uh, whatever you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's basically you, dude. <laughs> So yeah, so no, it was really fun. We had a good time, and um, we did, and it's it's triggered a whole load of conversations since that we we can't share too much about just about what we want to do with the show and how we want to keep growing it and moving it forward. So you know, we think we we have a good time doing Bad Voltage, and we think there's a lot of potential wrapped up in this. So uh, we're just talking through yeah. like what's the best avenue that we want to kind of take it forward. So you. Maybe hear a little bit more about that in uh, in, the, exactly. in the coming months. And if you if you if you listen to the live show and you like it and you think, hey, that's not fair, I couldn't get to that because that's miles away in Southern California, and you happen to run a conference and think that you need some evening entertainment, you know who to call. Yeah, not the <laughs> Ghostbusters. Um, <laughs> so, do well, we uh, do we have anything else? There's been some cool discussion on the forum. Um, there's your freaking entry to the US thing, right? <laughs> The, the, let's let's talk about the non-story some more. Like, <laughs> did you have any problems getting in and out? Ak? I did not, which was good. Um, I spent. I am uh, shocked. I spent a long time worrying about it. Um, and that does and not shock. <laughs> fortunately, <laughs> shut up. Fortunately, fortunately, I didn't have a problem, and that's a good thing. Well, you better yeah. hope that no one from the TSA listens to Bad Voltage, because after the live show, next time you travel into the US, you might. <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to get rubber gloved. Actually, I, I wonder if I know anyone who works for the TSA, because it would be great for you. You should experience a rubber glove at some point in your I, life. Uh, I, I, I don't want to... Um, I mean, you're welcome to try that, but I'm not sure you want to get on board this train, pal. <laughs> so... <laughs> Bear in mind, I don't know. I kind of want to get <laughs> that's right. I, I mean, I I'm, I'm willing... actually do know people who work for um, Her Majesty's Border Patrol, and you come here just as much as I go. <laughs> uh, you, yeah, but I just think the English are better at this. I mean, like I just think they're not going to bow to your ridiculous, uh, you know, your japery. 
you um, know. And also, like, what's the, what's the worst that's going to happen when you're going into England? Like, a uh, feather duster is placed to be bottom. I mean, you know, but that seems like know. that seems like not a fabulous outcome to me. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the feather duster. <laughs> it actually doesn't depend on the feather duster whatsoever. Right, that's enough. Right, we should move away from we should move away from this topic of discussion. Um. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say. Do you guys have anything? No, that was show six. It's been fabulous. Thank you very much for listening. Good night. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>